welcome to episode number 73 of the Chief Stakes and Controllers podcast, presented by Fox PHL The Gambler, 102.5 FM, 1480 AM, iHeartRadio, and wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Jason Finelli. I am the esports and gaming insider for Fox PHL The Gambler. And unfortunately, I have to start our episode off today on a uh, somber note um, after the news of the passing of Kyungbo Kim, a.k.a. Alarm, uh, the flex support player for the Philadelphia Fusion. As I have covered a couple times on this show, uh, during the offseason, the Fusion basically cleaned house. Uh, their coaches, their players, all except two, uh, left the team to go find other opportunities. Carpe was the one that remained, and Alarm, the other. Uh, 2020 uh, Rookie of the Year, uh, another uh, an, an MVP candidate that year, another strong season in 2021, was looking to come back in 2022 and continue that excellence, and unfortunately his, uh, his life has come to a tragic end. No details, really, on what happened, but um, yeah, he passed away at the age of 20 this week in South Korea. Uh, and everyone here at Fox PHL, the gambler gives their condolences, their thoughts and their prayers to, um, alarm to his family, to, uh, his friends and to the fusion organization for what must be a rough time, um, that they are going through at the moment. So, um, our best to them and, um, we, uh, we're, we're rooting for you, uh, more so than usual, uh, when it comes to something like this and, uh, and, and it, it's, a uh, Tough story to have to have witnessed live. Uh, broke about Monday night, I think, eight thirty Tuesday night, one of the two. Um, and just to see the outpouring of support from other players, from coaches, from um, other teams in the organization, other or, I'm sorry, other teams in the league, uh, was that was heartwarming. But um, you just wish it was on better terms, you know, um, not on the uh, on the unfortunate passing of a of a of a fellow player. So um, uh, rest in peace, alarm. And uh, we will, you will be uh, in the in the annals of fusion history for as long as uh, the team exists. Uh, you will not be forgotten. So, with that, I have to make the uh, uneasy segue into the six in sixty seconds. Edward Gaming dethrones defending champion Damwon Kia to become the twenty twenty one League of Legends World Champion. Rainbow Six Sieges Six Major Sweden has set its playoff bracket with three teams from Latin America, two teams each from Europe and Asia Pacific, and one from North America. Space Station Gaming is the lone NA team. Optic Gaming and Envy Gaming have merged their Call of Duty League teams into one Optic Texas beginning in 2022. Skump, Dashi, Shotzi, and Illy are the planned roster for the team that replaces both Optic Chicago and the Dallas Empire. Elsewhere, Sony has decreased its PlayStation 5 production forecast, citing worldwide manufacturing issues. Jump Force from Bandai Namco will be removed from online storefronts in February, with online sh servers being shut down in August. And finally, Riot Forge, a sub-developer of Riot Games, creator of League of Legends, uh, tweets for the first time since December of 2020, promising an update on their upcoming Ruined King, a League of Legends story RPG. Those are your six in 60 seconds. And as always, the six in 60 seconds are brought to you by the sponsor for cheese steaks and controllers. That is Ghost Shaver. The Ghost Shaver is designed to feel like an extension of your arm, allowing the user to reach anywhere on the head, face, or body. The precision cutting system gives you a close and smooth shave every single time. With five different rotary flex action super thin blades and a patented handle design that fits into the palm of your hand precisely. Go to ghostshaver.com to check things out and get yours. That's Ghost Shaver, a shave above the rest. All right, we are here with the first segment of episode 73, Cheek Stakes and Controllers this week. Thank you, as always, for listening. If, you, if it sounds a little different around me, it's because I'm not in my normal dungeon basement. I am in a beautiful conference room at 401 North Broad Street, which, to esports fans in the city, should be a very familiar address. That is the site of Nerd Street Gamers' brand new facility, The Block, which opens this Saturday, November 13th, grand opening. And I have sitting with me the CEO of 
of Nerd Street Gamers, Mr. John Fazio, to talk all about that. John, how are you today? Doing well. Thanks for uh, inviting me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. We've talked to many at uh, Nerd Street before. Pete Powell has been on a couple of times, and um, it's been great talking to everybody at Nerd Street about what's coming on, what's going on. And the big one, obviously, is The Block. It's finally happening. You broke ground, what, about a year and a half ago, something like that? Sure. Sure feels like that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't tell you at this point. The last two years are a time warp for me, as I'm sure they are for most people. Yeah, that's true. Uh, everything's been turned upside down. But you're finally here. Yep. Take me back to when you first... Uh, broke ground here. The plans were first laid out as to what you wanted to do in this building. Uh, take me back to the excitement that you had, and do you still feel that excitement today, or is uh, is it even more so now? Definitely more so. You know, uh, anytime you've got the uh, the ideas for something and then it materializes in front of you, you know, when you actually get to see it, it's it's a it's an amplified feeling. You know, it's like all of a sudden now all the things I can do with it. Before sure. it's like just get it open. Um, you know, we actually saw this space. Uh, three years ago, took, so it took about a year to get the lease done, to get the, the arrangement in place, um, and we ran a tournament in here two years ago before the pandemic, oh, sure. where it was just an open concrete box that we converted, decorated, and made look nice. <laughs> uh, if you go back and look at our CS videos, it'll look very different than it does now as a polished uh, you know arena, but right away we knew it was a, a perfect fit for us. Not only you know is it in the center of the city with a, a literal subway stop out front and as you know, publicly accessible as it could possibly be, it's an easy ride in for most suburbs around Philadelphia, so it's really easy access. Um, and also, this happens to be the digital on-ramp for the city, meaning this is the place where the primary fiber line that comes into Philadelphia for servicing us all internet is in this building, which means for gamers, it's the fastest possible internet you could play on. I was going to say, I don't expect any Wi-Fi or LAN issues in this building if you're sitting on top of the source, basically. Uh, that has to be very advantageous, and um, I assume a big part of why you chose this facility. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, the alignment between the company that owns this building and our model and the fact that, you know, we're a, a servicer in the technology sector, I think was obvious. Um, the other tenants in this building are Google, Netflix, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, you know, all the primary uh, providers of the games we're playing, uh, you know, Activision, EA, they all have servers and, and space in here. So uh, it, it's a really great place for us in terms of being close to those servers and getting really low proximity. But outside of that, it was all about location. It's just a great spot for us. Yeah, that's true. A good company. Yeah. Very good company to, to share server yeah. space with. Uh, so walk me through what people are going to see when they first walk into the block. It's a, it is a local host brand. And so if they're familiar with other local hosts in the city, East Falls, I believe, is where the one is. Um, it will probably look very similar, just a lot bigger. But walk me through what uh, maybe first-time visitors will find when they come in. Yeah, sure. So uh, the, the Baker Center, you know, the North Philadelphia space you mentioned, that's a location that uh, is a retail footprint. So it's two, 3,000 square feet smaller. That's meant to get, you know, kids who are playing for their high school team in and playing and competing. When you're ready for, you know, your state championships, this is where you come. This okay. is the big building. So as you walk into this building, it's a you know, 20,000 square foot plus space, big open ceilings. You're going to see rows of computers and consoles and monitors where you know, gamers play. Then you're going to see a large stage. And the analogy for you know, sports fans is you, you may have uh, you know, gone to a soccer tournament or a basketball tournament. You play in a gym with 40 different courts in there, but there's one court with the stadium seating. It's the real nice one with the nice backboard, you know, the nice buzzer and whatever. Uh, and so you know, that's kind of how it is for us where you may play in your group stages, play in your everyday matches in the, the PC pit, as we call it, uh, and then go up on the stage when you make the playoffs or when you're ready for a larger match. So, you know, open air, bright, well lit. It's a nice designed space with exposed concrete. You know, we wanted to keep it Philly. Uh, the, the, the too often in the gaming sector, you know, you get dark, grungy basement feeling, LED lit, you know, black light kind of feeling. That's not what we're about. We wanted to bring this out into the open. This is for everyone. This is supposed to feel like you're walking into a gymnasium or a traditional sports facility. It is a gorgeous facility down there. Uh, definitely bright, like you said. The use of the color green, very big in Philly. I appreciate that. Um, just a beautiful lot. The rows of consoles, everything looks clean and, and, and legit. Uh, for one thing, it's a very nice place to play. Definitely a lot nicer than the basement dungeon where I record this show. So I, I, I'm very impressed by what I saw down there. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, 
the competitions, the, the, high, the high schools and local colleges. I understand that you have some partnerships not only with colleges in the city, but with uh, uh, established esports teams who are going to come in and use your facilities for training and perhaps even hosting matches. Get in, talk, talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Sure. So, you know, this is, we call it a campus, right? The esports campus. And, and it's Nerd Streets the block. On the first floor, you got Nerd Streets local host. On the second floor, we have the mezzanine space, which on there we have pro esports teams that are, you know, uh, renting the space so that they can train there full time. So the Susquehanna Sonics, which is a pro esports team who's had incredible success across a variety of games and came out of the Susquehanna Harrisburg area, um, they're going to be placing their home training facility here. They're cool. an international team with players from all over the world. They'll be on the second floor. That's where they're going to train every day, play every day, and then come downstairs to compete in, in matches and use that as their home arena. Um, in addition to that, we'll have studios on that second uh, that second facility, that second story facility. Um, um, as well as uh, housing space for the temple, um, their, their school of hospitality and sports. Um, we're housing a partnership with Jefferson that's working on focus on health and gamers. And so uh, the idea when I say campus is that we're allowing, you know, the medium that we have to connect with this esports industry to, for everybody, you know, for, for community centers, for high schools, for districts, for Jefferson, for Temple, et cetera. Uh, and, and we really want to create that, that hub and home. And then on the fifth floor here, we have our corporate HQ. So our entire company of, you know, uh, just over 70 full-time employees will be right here in the building. So everybody in one space, was that a big part of choosing this facility as well? So that way you could move everything, Nerd Street, into one central facility. That way you're on the fifth floor while something's going down on the first floor. You don't have to come from across the city if something, you know, would happen. Exactly. You know, when we first set out to build our space, we had assumed that we'd be building an arena and then an office space. And sure. the fact that we found them in a place where we could do it together was just um, kismet. It was awesome. You know, it wasn't something we expected. And now, you know, again, this we didn't set out to build an esports campus, right? We set out to get our HQ and to build an arena. Uh, and when it merged together and suddenly the other people who heard what we were doing in the city started reaching out, it really started to snowball into what, you know, is now truly a campus for, for esports. Now, have you used other arenas, esports arenas around the country as like a inspiration for building this one? I know HyperX has the one, or they were, it was HyperX in Las Vegas. Yep. Uh, I know Belong Gaming, I think it's called, has a couple throughout. What were you using, so have you, did you visit other arenas or were you, did you have an idea in your mind of what you wanted this to look like? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think um, it definitely stems from the experience seeing arenas all across the world and, and the country. You know, I, I think I give a lot of credit to Esports Arena, who was really the first player out here. I know now they're focused on the Walmart stores that they're installing. Mm -hmm. um, when I first saw their space in Santa Ana, it was one of the you know major design inspirations because it was the first time I walked into an esports center that wasn't dark and grungy. They had a big open space with exposed wood beams, and it was just really nice. And so we definitely aimed you know for that aesthetic, and I give them a lot of credit. Um, Allied Esports, who owns HyperX Las Vegas, uh, you know they're um, they're a partner of ours. We partner with them to produce our events and other venues, cool. and so um, they're they're a great partner, and and they're definitely. Some Somebody that um, you know we collaborate with on, on, the, on the peer level, um, but at the end of the day, I think what we built was something that didn't exist. You know, we, we had a dream for where this could go, um, and, and you know what it meant to us was we've got a bunch of tournament operators, you know, and people, community builders who've been around for decades, literally building these event communities that used to drag their PCs into a bar and hook them up to play, uh, or drag their consoles into a hotel, you know, conference room and set up, uh, and now we're giving them the dedicated home but what it means for us is it's it's our dream manifested sure. and so the tools that we wished we had in those conference rooms the tools we wished we had in the bar the computers we wished we had you know you name it we were able to go design it for ourselves for our usage um, and in that way you know as we are community builders and event promoters that's what we're here to service is those people and so we'll continue to take that input and be inspired by the community um, so yeah there, there's a lot of people we we can pay homage to but this was something that I don't think uh, you know exists anywhere else in the country sure i would agree with that 100 percent. now question this is one from dear in my heart why philly obviously nerd street started here obviously you were born it was born and built here but philly is sometimes considered the younger brother of say new york or dc stuck right in the middle what made it that you wanted to build here in philly as opposed to two of those quote bigger markets sure there's the simple answer and the long answer the simple answer is i was born and raised in philly yes. my whole family's here uh you know there, there's like 30 plus Fazio's running around the city all in my <laughs> inner family so uh you know it's hard to leave that kind of uh, footprint 
if you ask me where you know I would have built my ideal, it might have been San Diego, somewhere sunny and warm <laughs> all year round. You know, fair. Uh, so I'm here, you know, for that reason. But with that said, I've now, you know, this is the second company I've built here in Philadelphia. My first being the software engineering uh, firm Jarvis, uh, and so I've got you know two decades of experience working in this culture here, this tech you know kind of corridor that is Philadelphia. And I'll tell you that what's most unique about it, and anybody who lives in Philly, anybody who's from Philly knows that we have a very unique persona. You know, there's this it's a nice way to put it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, the, the 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 sports fans of the world will look at us with a pretty accurate perception, and you know, we'll say we we tell it like it is. And in the business world, that's really great. You know, it's it, it really allows you to um, go out there and sound out your ideas without the extra that you might get from some of the other tech-oriented towns and the fluff. And your your business sucks. You're gonna get told it sucks real yeah. quick here. Um, but beyond that, you've got a lot of people who want to do it themselves. And there's this really strong bootstrapping ethos here, meaning people who aren't just going Going out to Silicon Valley to get VC money and I'm not downplaying that we did that we of course are using that for expansion but we started in a scrappy North Philly warehouse where we built it ourselves we wrote the first check ourselves we built every computer ourselves did the networking ourselves cut our crimp the cables ourselves um, and that attitude I think really helped inform you know what we would do and and, and kind of guided us in, in in what we've been doing and I, I give credit to Philly and, and the behavior and the attitude here uh, for that the other thing that's you know always been a huge plus is the Im the immense amount of talent that's in Philly we've got you know not only this you know this tech quarter fed by University of Pennsylvania from Drexel from Temple from St. Joe's LaSalle Villanova you name it we've got this quarter of high institute you know high education institutions uh, that create an incredible amount of you know talent to recruit from when you're building these businesses combine that with this you know the scrappy attitude we have and a whole community of people around here that, that have cared about gaming for decades, it, it's an ideal place to start your business, especially in the video game world. Now, I agree with you on the business talent aspect, but I think there's something to be said about the gaming talent aspect as well. Would Nerd Street ever consider making its own esports team under the NSG logo? Definitely not. Uh, <laughs> so I, 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 you know, I'm not much of an absolutist. I'm not one to say no absolutely uh, often here, but I'd say it's pretty pretty confident that we would not do that. Uh, the reality is we need to stay agnostic. You know, okay. I, I don't want to run a tournament where people are wondering if our team got you know special treatment. Um, and so you know we're agnostic to the teams. We've got team partners across the country. Practically every single large pro scale team in the country utilizes our services in some way or another. And so we'll we'll stay away from that um, you know it is a passion of mine so personally maybe it's something I get interested in, in the future but as a company I can say uh, pretty strongly that it's something we'll avoid honestly team Fazio sounds pretty good I'm not gonna lie <laughs> I'm, I'm not for using my own name <laughs> we'll, we'll come up with something, way something better. Like so let's talk about the grand opening of the block this Saturday November 13th um, not sure we'll get into what time the doors open and everything like that but what if someone's coming for the grand opening what sort of uh, other than you know being able to use the facility uh, will they expect you to have any special festivities anything going on yeah so we're running a counter-strike tournament here and not only is it a counter-strike tournament it's our own Philadelphia born tournament called Fragadelphia. Oh, cool. Uh, cool. We named this tournament back when Always Sunny had taken off and they were doing their Flipadelphia thing. Yep. Uh, and frag is a video game term where, you know, you throw a grenade, it's called a frag. Happens to me a lot. <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, Fragadelphia was born and we started by dragging a bunch of PCs, you know, BYOC, bring your own console, where everybody came with their own console, their own monitor, hooked it up in our warehouse and played uh, back in like 2012, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then 2013, 2014, we started building and buying PCs and started, you know, removing the BYOC element. And now it's North America's largest amateur Counter-Strike tournament. And it's, uh, you know, critically acclaimed, acclaimed across the, the entire planet now. Um, and we're hosting the Fragadelphia tournament here on the grand opening. So when you come in, you'll get to see that. That's a five-on-five -five tournament, very teamwork-oriented. Um, it is a shooter game, so it's for adults. You know, it's not our Smash Brothers tournament, which will also be going on in the same time and is a little bit more kid-friendly. Um, um, it is a shooter game, but it's a strategic game. It's it's a really incredible uh, team-based strategy uh, kind of environment that you know really gives you that you know teamwork camaraderie feeling you get from traditional sports. Uh, and then Smash Brothers will be going on at the same time, which you know is singles, doubles, uh, you know kind of smaller group of play, a little bit more uh, kid-friendly oriented. Um, and then in addition to those two tournaments, which will be going on, we'll have uh, open play on the PCs where anybody can come in, play any game you want, hang out, try 
out the different systems. We've got the best computers you could possibly play on. Uh, they're top of the line equipment, so it'll be a really uh, unique experience. And then all of this will be broadcast online, so oh. you can watch it on t Twitch and you know see the, the the elements of the studios that we've talked about, the stage and the casters will all be up online, so you can you know be here, be a part of it, and maybe be on the stream yourself. What time does that kick off? You'll have to confirm with my marketing <laughs> team, so I'm not wrong, um, but we'll be here all day. Okay, awesome. And then um, finally, what do you have coming up like maybe in the near future? I know you guys have partnered with Riot Games for the Valorant Champions Tour. Those finals are coming up now that the last chance qualifier is over. Will you be doing, I don't know if you'll be doing anything here, but will you, you'll be doing stuff with them. So give me a little bit of Nerd Street's future, not only just at the block, but also including that and maybe other things. In the yeah, so uh, probably too short notice to get the VCT in here, although I'd love to, and That'd hopefully be... next year that's something that we do. Um, you know, Riot's an incredible partner. They've been, you know, an eSports proponent for building the community since day one, uh, but we also have relationships with the other publishers like Activision, Electronic Arts, and then some of the brands that create really awesome tournaments like Red Bull. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll leverage those relationships to keep this venue programmed. Uh, you know, this is an event-driven space. This is where you're going to come and see events and tournaments and camps and things happening um, whereas walk-in traffic is awesome and it's a big part of it but it's an event program space so you can expect lots more of this as we roll out over the next year uh, I'm we're in this awkward you know pandemics almost over but not totally over phase where the bookings aren't fully happening yet sure um, we're starting to get hybrid bookings where it's no crowd and players in person and um, I think over the next six months we'll really transition back to you know the full-fledged uh, live events and at that point I think it, it, it'll get really exciting here yeah i agree i'm very much looking forward to the future of this facility now that the pandemic is waning and we could start filling this place with a lot of rabid esports fans who have been waiting two three years for this pandemic to pass so they can get back into a live uh, situation john fazio ceo of nerd street gamers thank you so much for your time i do appreciate it yeah absolutely the only thing that I'll, I'll add here is that you know this space is about more than just the people who already can compete this is about connecting more people you know and, and the unfortunate reality here is in philadelphia we learned during the pandemic that despite every student having a laptop many didn't have broadband internet at home to connect and, you know for remote learning let alone playing video games right. and you know we talk about this industry as something that's really incredible and exciting that can send kids to college and create pro careers but unfortunately right now now it's really only the middle class kids who get to take advantage of that. If you're somebody who doesn't have access to internet or playing on an older console or don't have a gaming PC, you're left out. And building a space like this is all about connecting those people who need access to this the most to the technology you need to compete, and then we can really open this up for everybody. And that's what we're excited to do here. I agree 100%. John, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, yes, welcome back to Cheesesteaks and Controllers, episode 73, rolling right along here. Thank you to John Fazio, CEO of Nerd Street, for uh, agreeing to meet with me to talk about the block, which grands opens tomorrow. I'm sorry, yeah, tomorrow, if you're listening to this when the podcast goes down. Uh, today, if you're listening to it on the radio, the grand opening of the block, 401 North Broad Street, there in Philadelphia. A beautiful facility, I was able to tour it. Uh, after, before I spoke to John, he walked me through and showed me everything that goes that's in there. I saw some uh, live competition through uh, Northeast Championships by Big E Gaming. Love those people there, too. They run a great ship there. Uh, just a great, great Sunday uh, spent hanging out, watching eSports in a brand new, beautiful facility. And I am very excited for them to uh, kick that place off uh, with some great tournaments coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but our second segment here tonight is uh, something that I've done a little more frequently recently, uh, just because I've had some folks reach out to me uh, with some things, and I have been happy to review them. So today we are reviewing again a uh, product. We are b b going off of the... Um, the Magnus, the Secret Lab desk that I reviewed a couple of weeks ago, uh, and also we reviewed Guardians of the Galaxy from Square Enix last week, and I believe there was another, uh, oh, the Lines, yes, the Nano Leaf, the new Nano Leaf product we reviewed as well. Uh, this week we are reviewing something a little more, um, let's say, active, and by that I mean the when you put the Nano Leaf lines up on the wall, uh, they stay there until you turn them on and illuminate your room make it nice and pretty uh the magnus is despite being a very good one a desk it doesn't really go anywhere uh doesn't do anything other than hold stuff it holds stuff very well but it just holds stuff uh but today thanks to the excellent people at vertigear uh who make gaming chairs i am now currently sitting on 
the Vertigear PL6000 gaming chair. Currently holding my backside, and it had to be the PL6000 because that is the only Vertigear chair in their portfolio that would be able to. Um, and that is very much a slight at me and not them. Um, so first and foremost, uh, when, you're, when I'm reviewing a gaming chair, the first thing I think of is how easy it is to build. Um, because, you know, obviously the, the chairs don't come as they are presented online. You have to put them together, put the wheels on, put everything uh, in its proper place. This chair took me all of 25 minutes uh, to build, 25 to 30 minutes. It was one of the easiest builds I have ever done for any product I've ever had. Um, it was easier than the desk, thanks to the magpad. It was easier than the arcade machine. It was easier than any furniture I've put up in my house. It was easier than any gaming chairs I've, or, or computer chairs I've built before. It was so simple. The directions are clear. The uh, places that they go are clear. The package uh, that holds everything is clear as to what is what. And I had no trouble whatsoever uh, getting this chair built and in my uh, little basement dungeon as i called it in the previous segment so for building uh this thing it gets a 10 out of 10 definitely idiot proof just like the magnus was and as i am an idiot um i very much like when things are idiot proof so i appreciate that uh from vertigear making it easy for me to put this thing together and to get my backside on it so now that i'm sitting on it the next thing is comfort just flat comfort and admittedly, um, I would not score this as high only because even after breaking it in, it's still a little stiff, right? Under my uh, under my uh, my fanny here, my backside. Uh, it's still just not, qu maybe it's not quite broken in yet. Maybe I haven't properly gotten the butt groove like Homer Simpson's couch in that classic Simpsons episode. But um, I just... I, I need a little more give in the back cushion, uh, in the in the in the bottom cushion. The back cushion, on the on the other hand, that that, that where your back support is amazing. Uh, it's some of the best back support I've ever had in a chair ever. Um, it's just when I sometimes when I sit down, it feels like I'm sitting on like a flat surface, not quite the cushiony gaming chair seat I would I'd be hoping for. I have I have a feeling that they may continue. I've only had the chair for about a week now. Uh, I've been using it for about a week. So I think that will come the more I sit in it. But right now, I would put the bottom comfort at about 7 uh, with the back comfort at a 9. Uh, so put them together, it's an 8 out of 10. Um, it is very, it is firm. It holds me. Uh, I, have not, I have not had to worry about my... Um, heavier than it should be frame going through the chair or breaking anything it had it leans with me uh, there are plenty of adjustments which is the next thing i'll get into um that allows me to you know move around it's not it, it actually moves around on a carpet believe it or not these wheels are very good on carpet i have it on a it's like a it's a thin carpet it's not like a very uh it's not a tough one to be able to roll around, so I will say that. But at the same time, my previous chair had a heck of a time getting around this car, but this one does not. So um, I do appreciate that as well. It is very versatile um, so far in the seats uh, when it comes to the armrests, when it comes to the angle of which the back of the chair goes. Um, everything is very clearly laid out in the directions of how to adjust it. So I can adjust this chair to my exact specifications my the way i i want this thing to be it will be um so when it comes to i i don't know, I don't know personalization i guess the word would be uh that's a 10 out of 10 as well just an absolutely perfectly adjustable um, arms and the back everything can be done right to where i want it so i am always at maximum comfort whenever i sit in it um or at least it will be once the, the bottom part breaks in a little more, I think. So no complaints as far as being able to adjust the seats to my liking. Um, I like a high chair, um, not because I'm a baby, but I just, I just like sitting high where my legs are almost at a 90 degree angle. I know some folks like it where their knees are a little higher up or if they're a little um, 
if the angle, if they can like put them underneath their legs. I just like a perfect 90 degree angle when I sit and this chair fits to me perfectly. So, um, as a, as a larger fella, uh, having a chair that's able to do that is something I do appreciate. Uh, PL 6,000 is definitely achieving its goal in that regard. Um, but then finally, the last part I want to talk about with this is the extra cushions, extra pillows. And I may be a dum dum. It's entirely possible that I am a dum dum, but I can't for the life of me figure out the lumbar support pillow. The way the clips are on this thing, I cannot figure out how it's supposed to stay on the chair itself. It's, it's here. I've just been placing it behind my back where I want it and then leaning into it. But I cannot, for the life of me, even with the directions, figure out how to get this thing to stick. Now, it could be just a lack of familiarity with the gaming chair. Admittedly, this is my first one ever uh, a, a specific gaming desk chair never had one before so there could be some steps that people who have had multiple chairs in the past would be familiar with that i'm just not um it could just be that i'm a dope the the clips are there it seems like they should just clip around the base of the chair but I don't, I can't, I don't know if there's slots that those straps go in or if there's something that I'm just missing that it's not going to, I don't know. But um, that right there is the most mystifying thing about this chair. Um, once I figure it out, I think it'll be great. But right now, uh, unable to put the lumbar support where it needs to be. I have to put it there every single, every single, every single time I sit down. Um, I'd have to put the lumbar support pillow at about a, a six or seven out of ten. Uh, it's very comfortable when it goes in the spot it needs to go into. It just, for whatever reason, I can't figure out the straps yet, and the directions did not make it very clear. Uh, the head support, however, that head support pillow, super easy. Figured it out immediately. Very comfortable. Perfect. No complaints. No notes. 10 out of 10. Awesome. So uh, if I'm taking the chair as a whole, and I'm putting a score on the chair. I'm, I'm sure some of you who are listening will listen to all the numbers I said, average them out, and tell me that the number I'm about to say doesn't match. But um, I would put this chair at a solid 9. Solid 9 out of 10 for the chair. I appreciate that it holds my backside. I appreciate uh, that it's completely... Uh, it, it can be completely personalized. Like if I prefer my armrests to be up... At my sides, I can put them there. If I want them to be lower, I can put them there. If I want to lay back as far as possible on the seat, I can do that simply. Uh, if I want to be you know, as upright as possible, I can do that too. Um, my previous chair before this was just a desk chair. I would put it at the very top of its height, which, um, like, like I said earlier, is how I like to sit. I like to be as high as possible when I'm sitting in the chair. Um but as I would work in the older chair, it would slowly like shoot me back down to lower level, like boom, and then it would be like a like a like a jerking motion. It would, I would feel it drop a little bit and then catch itself, and then drop again and catch itself, drop again and catch itself until it got to the bottom. That chair could not hold me. This one can. This one is built out of some strong stuff. It has not dipped once. It has not had a problem anywhere in that regard. Um, and it is a nice seat to sit in. The only things, like I said, the only real issues I had were that I wish the uh, bottom chair would be a little more um, giving. I think that will come with time. The more I sit in it, the more I use it, the more um, I create my Homer Simpson butt groove. I think that'll happen. Uh, and then the lumbar support pillow, which just I can't figure out. I can't for the life of me figure it out. And I'm not the only one. I've had other people come in and take a look at it. They couldn't figure it out either. Um, I don't know if it's a design from Vertigear or if it's, like I said, how the pillows go and we're all just not familiar with the format yet, not having a gaming chair in the house before. Once I figure it out, I'm sure it'll be great. Um, in fact, I may play with it after this and then try to put an addendum in, in segment number three just to say, yep, figured it out. It's nice. But um, those two things do not really sour my opinion on the entire chair the chair is wonderful it is a very nice comfortable chair gets the job done keeps me awake and alert throughout the work day unlike the older chair where it sagged so far back i would tr almost doze off or fall asleep um i have to shake myself out of it 
this chair does a great job. It, um, it, it, it holds up well, and that's why it earns a solid 9 out of 10 from me uh, and the Chief Stakes and Controllers podcast. If you are in the market for a new gaming chair uh, and you need one that, like me, needs to hold up a considerable amount of uh, person, then uh, the EL6000 over at Vertigear would be a solid, solid choice. They have multiple colors to choose from. Uh, my favorite one, not the one I got, but my favorite one that I looked at uh, was a orange and black um, set. Uh, looked just like it was perfect for Flyers fans. So if you have a Flyers fan who's a gamer in your life and they're looking for a new chair, PL6000, orange and black, you're set. Uh, mine is the white and black, gorgeous, uh, very, very nice looking plush. And there are, um, or leather, excuse me, uh, and there are some great other colors on there too. Plenty of plenty of options. And uh, like I said, if you're if you're a big guy like me, or if you're a if you're a big person and you need a little more give in your chair, um, this is the one for you. Um, at least of the ones I've tried so far. If it holds me, it'll hold you. And that's why I say a perfect, uh, not a perfect, a great nine out of ten uh, for the PL six thousand from Vertigear chair um and uh i full disclosure they did send this to me for review uh it's my chair they, they sent it to me it was very very kind of them uh to do that they approached me i didn't have to ask for it um but they did send it to me uh for this review just as a disclosure um but it's still impressed despite that and uh, i think it earns the nine out of ten score that i am giving it so vertigear pl 6000 nine out of ten so finally tonight here on Cheese Steaks and Controllers, episode number 73, uh, I want to humble brag just for a little bit. Um, this week, uh, Wednesday, yesterday, uh, while I was in San Francisco, more on that next week, um, I had an article drop over at GameSpot.com, one of the biggest articles I've ever had written. Uh, as you know, I'm not just the host of this podcast, I also... Um, do write uh, freelance writing for multiple websites. I'm featured uh, prominently now on GameSpot.com, MMORPG.com, Esports.gg, and a few others. Um, but this one was a full retrospective on Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, from that first teaser in March 2018, all the way to the final Sora trailer on October the 5th of this year. Um, went through all of the different trailers when they came out. I linked to all of them, so they're all there. If you ever wanted to see the history of Smash Brothers reveals, it's all in this one piece. Uh, and I was also very fortunate to be able to get um, some insight from multiple people uh, who were involved in the project. I got um, a producer on the Tekken team, Michael Murray, who is basically the right-hand man of Katsuhiro Harada, who created Tekken. Uh, I got the director of the Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts series at Square Enix, Tetsuya Nomura, a legend in this industry, gave me some quotes. Grant Kirkhope, the composer of Banjo-Kazooie, Perfect Dark, and more, uh, gave me um, some insight here. Just a fascinating article it turned out to be, uh, and a rare, um, dare I say, peek behind the curtain uh, at the people who negotiate deals like this, uh, and the way that they feel about them, and the way they feel about the reactions to them. Uh, when they are announced. To hear that Tetsuya Nomura, a man who, among other things, wrote Final Fantasy VII. So that's how that's, a, that's the kind of caliber of um, person that we're talking about here. Watches reaction videos on YouTube like I do, sitting in my basement like a schlub. Um, he does it just to see how people react to his work. Um, is fascinating to me. Um, I, I, I don't know if, if he just has more time than I thought he did or if he incorporates into his work. Now, this is not the first time um, I have heard tell that he or people on his team have watched reaction videos. If you go back to uh, a ret a similar retrospective piece on Final Fantasy VII, it was a video by Maximilian, uh, Maximilian Dude on YouTube. Uh, he mentioned how uh, the Final Fantasy VII remake team showed his reaction to the initial reveal at E3 2015 to the developers when morale was low uh, and they needed a boost. Um, and that's a story that stuck with him. I find that to be very, very cool. Uh, so, uh, this, again, it's not the first time that Nomura or anyone on the Final Fantasy team has 
in, has inclined the, or has intimated the fact that they watch these reaction videos actively. Uh, but again, just to get this peek behind the curtain for multiple people across the industry. Hell, I got a VP from Disney and Pixar Games to talk about Sora. Just mind-blowing stuff, and I was happy to share it with you. Uh, so go over to GameSpot.com and check that out. But I bring it up not only because I just wanted to humble brag for a second, but it also is an interesting segue to something that I also think is an interesting conversation. And that is the future of Super Smash Brothers. Where does the franchise go from here? And the, the, the speculation has already started with the announcement, with the release of Sora uh, on October the 19th. People are, 18th, excuse me. People are wondering what, what, where do you go from here? What do you do now? Um, Masahiro Sakurai, the director, uh, the leader of Super Smash Bros., basically the face of the franchise, um, especially in this ultimate cycle with all the Mr. Sakurai presents um, presentations that he did introducing all the DLC characters, starting with Hero. Uh, Joker was the only one that missed one. Um, he has said that he doesn't know if another Smash Brothers would happen without him, and he doesn't know if he wants to do another Smash Brothers. So, and even then, even with him or without him, where do you go from here? Calling it Super Smash Bros. Ultimate ended up being more fitting than I think they wanted it to be in the beginning. Uh, obviously, it, was, it could have been called Ultimate from the start as soon as we saw the Everyone is Here trailer that announced that everybody came back, uh, was coming back from previous Smash Bros. games into this new one, even characters who were previously cut like uh, Ice Climbers were cut from Smash on Wii U and 3DS. They were back. Solid Snake was back. Hadn't seen him since Super Smash Bros. Brawl on the Wii. Um, really the first guest character was finally coming back and stuff like that. So the ultimate name did make sense, obviously, at the time, but even more so now. Now that the entire roster has been filled out, we know everybody who's in the game. No one else is coming. Nothing else is being added. The game has been moonlighted uh, or will be officially moonlighted once the fla- the final like tournament and uh, spirit events happen. I think November 19th uh, was the date that it will be officially done. Um, where does Super Smash Brothers go from here? Uh, and honestly, I think there are two answers to that. There are two ways that they could go. The first one is nowhere. This is it. We will never see another Super Smash Brothers Ultimate again, or Super Smash Brothers again, in this capacity. The name will be retired from here on out. Now, does that mean we will no longer see a Nintendo video game with Nintendo characters doing battle against one another? No. But that leads into my second point. Um, I feel like Super Smash Brothers Ultimate will never be topped. It's an impossible feat, and it was an impossible feat from that Everyone Is Here trailer in E3 2018. Being able to get everybody back from all the previous games was a Herculean task in itself. Cloud Strife, rumors say, was impossible to bring back. Granted, Nomura-san in my article said that uh, he was happy to have three characters in there, and it was a great honor. Uh, between Klaus, Sephiroth, and Sora. But still, just those rights alone had to be monumental for some of those characters. And then you pile on all the characters you added after that. Some characters that some people forget are third party. I, Because I always associate the games with original and Super Nintendo, I forget the Castlevania is not a Nintendo property. It's Konami. That's a third-party character they would have to renegotiate if they ever wanted to go in the Super Smash Brothers route and bring them back. Um, King K. Rule is is in-house. That wouldn't be an issue. Same with Ridley. Same with Inkling. Um, I'm just going through the new characters here. Um, Incineroar, Ken from Capcom. Ryu from Capcom. Mega Man from Capcom. And, and two of those returned. It's, I can't imagine the amount of work. I mean, if you, you just all you have to do is look at the end of the Sora trailer with the credits and all the companies who are in that copyright section 
and it just kept growing and growing and growing with every trailer. Uh, finally, Disney being the last one down there next to Mojang uh, from Minecraft. Minecraft is another one. Oh, man, see? So, to me, I think that the logical step here is twofold. I know I said it was one or the other earlier, but they're actually twofold. Um, first is you retire the name Super Smash Brothers. You never use it again because it's done. It is a it is officially a five game franchise. Nintendo sixty four, Melee on GameCube, Brawl on Wii, Wii U and three DS, and Ultimate. It's over. Smash Brothers as we know it is over. There's no way you can continue with. But and here comes part two. What you could do. And if you wanted to adapt the Super Smash Brothers name to it, they could. I don't think it would be a good idea, um, unless Super Smash Brothers was like a subtitle for the main title. Like instead of Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, in in this example, it would be Ultimate Super Smash Brothers, um, or like how Metal Gear Solid is actual tactical espionage action Metal Gear Solid that sort of thing. I feel like this is the perfect time. Now, this uncertain transition period to pivot Nintendo's all-star fighting game from the platform fighter that it is now to a more traditional 2D or 3D fighter. I think it would work better as a 2D fighter. Um... If you want to try and make it a 3D fighter, you go right ahead. I just feel like it, it's better suited as a Street Fighter V or a Mortal Kombat 11 or or uh, Guilty Gear Strive or something like that. I think now is the time that you take the idea of Mario and Link and Pikachu and Kirby and Yoshi and all of these famous Nintendo characters and you put them in a f- traditional 2D six-button fighting game. Sakurai is clearly a fan of that type of game. Go watch the Mr. Sakurai Presents Terry Bogard presentation from November 2019, where it's basically a 45-minute history of SNK fighting games, Fatal Fury, Art of Fighting, King of Fighters, so on and so forth, with his Smash Brothers moveset mixed in. You know that he has been playing fighting games forever, You know that this was his take on a platform fighter because it's probably what he was asked to do back in the day. He was asked to do, you know, have them fight, or it was a a pre-existing model of a platform fighter that they eventually just put the um, Nintendo characters into. It wasn't like it was built to be a Mario versus Yoshi fighting game. It was built as a platform fighter that they then made Super Smash Brothers by putting in Mario and everybody else. So I think now would be a great time to create a traditional Nintendo fighter and put it up against the Street Fighters and the Mortal Kombats and the um, Guilty Gears and all those. Uh, and and I'm, I'm coming at this from a competitive gaming standpoint. I know I am doing that, and Nintendo does not give hide nor hair about those things doesn't care about competitive gaming never has never will uh, or they did for a little bit but they don't anymore but i feel like a traditional normal 2d fighting game starring mario and link and luigi i would you could build the initial roster to about maybe 25 30 characters You would technically be starting from scratch, even though you wouldn't be starting from scratch. It's a brand new spinoff of a franchise, not necessarily the actual franchise. So the previous movesets, none of that matters now. You're hitting the reset button, and in doing so, you're changing the genre as well. I feel like that is the best course of action for the idea of Nintendo mascots beating the crap out of each other in a video game. I do not think a sixth Super Smash Brothers game is wise, and I do not think a super sixth Super Smash Brothers game would ever happen. Or at least would never reach 
the levels of euphoria that this one did with its multiple reveals of completely bat crap out of left field. It'll never happen sort of announcements. I don't think you'll ever have that again with the current iteration of Super Smash Brothers because a sixth game could not pull the everyone is here again. They just could not do it. So I think now is the time to retire Super Smash Brothers as we know it. And then the next Nintendo mascot fighter be a more traditional 2D affair. I don't know that many people are going to agree with me on this. I don't know that many people will have the same vision that I do. But I love Super Smash Brothers. I love the idea of these characters being able to duke it out against each other. But I just do not see a future where a sixth one can be anywhere near as successful as the fifth one. Do you develop a game strictly to be a stepping stone? Is that what a sixth Super Smash Brothers would be? Like the first of the new era? That to me is silly. I think now the franchise has reached its peak. It's reached its pinnacle. So you have to start a new, new name, new format, new roster, and just go from the beginning all over again. Give them a Capcom SNK style uh, control scheme with the quarter circles and stuff like that. If you want to have a little fun and make it 2v2 or 3v3 like a Marvel, that would be amazing. Do what Dragon Ball Fighter Z did with Dragon Ball Z and do it with Nintendo mascots. All about that life. Sign me up. But the, the, the Super Smash Brothers that we know and we have known since 1999 will not and cannot continue in my, in my eyes. I just don't see it. Um, but I don't make the games. So maybe they have an idea that I just haven't thought of yet. But um, if it's me making the calls, I feel like now is the time to completely restart that franchise and put it somewhere else. Um, so go and remind yourself at GameSpot.com. Go reminisce about what it was. Think about what the future may hold. It probably wouldn't be anywhere until five or six years from now, if it happens at all. Um, so don't put any stock. Don't think that what I'm saying right now is going to happen anytime soon. I'm not an insider like that. I don't have that information. I'm just, t- I'm just telling you what I would do if I was uh, Nintendo. I would take the opportunity to make a traditional 2D fighter because the idea of your mascots fighting each other, unlike in 1999 when Smash Brothers came out and you felt like you needed an additional gimmick, uh, the idea is not foreign anymore. So putting them in a standard fighter makes a ton of sense. And with that, we are at the end of episode number 73 of the Chief Stakes and Controllers podcast, presented by Fox PHL The Gambler, 102.5 FM, 1480 AM, iHeartRadio, and wherever you get your podcasts, uh, wherever you're listening to this right now. Uh, If you're listening to these words, uh, as always, thank you so much for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed our interview with John Fazio, Nerd Street CEO. Um, Hope you enjoyed my review of the Vertigear PL6000. Um, it's a good chair for a big old butt like mine. So uh, if you're looking for one of those, you could, you could do, could do worse. Um, it's, it's, it, and I don't know how much better you're going to do. Uh, so check that chair out. Um, if you're looking, but in the meantime, uh, I will be back next week with episode number 74, climbing towards another milestone, episode 75 on the horizon. Not sure what's going to happen there, but, uh, we'll see as time goes on. So, With that, we are at the end of another episode of Cheese Steaks and Controllers. Have a great weekend. Have a great week right behind it. And I will talk to you again next week for episode 74. Goodbye.